Good morning, Bethlehem Covenant Church. Thanks for joining us on this Father's Day, June 20th. Glad that you are with us. Um, I wonder, you know, as we think about Father's Day every year, just like Mother's Day, uh, we first think about our own parents and we think about what difference they made in our life. And we, th I think about my dad and, and uh, boy, we, him and I, we, you know, we have a lot in common. I see a lot of the traits that are in him uh, that are in me now and and I can look at my own son now Matthew and my daughter Aria and I can I can see part of of me now and him passed on down and and uh, one of the greatest things though about my father is his love for all people and his love for God and he when he was convicted of something in the Word of God he taught it to us as a family and he prayed with us and he's the one who prayed with me when i was seven years old and asked christ into my heart and he was a great role model and example and uh, still is still somebody of wisdom that i go to and talk to um, and uh, very thankful for my father on this father's day and uh, i'm very thankful for our heavenly father as well a father to the fatherless uh, he's talked about in scripture but also uh, Jesus communicated to us that in him we are children of God. And so uh, he is our father as well. First John 3 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And uh, so, you know, we pray our Father who art in heaven and we we are to trust and not worry because our Father knows what we need before we even ask. And so every Father's Day, not only do we give thanks for the, the dads and the men in our life, but we also thank God that He is our Father and that we are counted among His children uh, forever and ever. What a beautiful thing. This is our Father's world, and we get to live in it and be a part of it. So I hope that encourages you today. Uh, today, uh, uh, we have Jorge Zuniga uh, preaching for us. He's a, a beloved member of our congregation and has taught many a Sunday school class. He's a, a scientist who has now studied the Word of God and, and has been changed by it. And he's bringing the message today on this Father's Day from Genesis 22. Um, where what a calling of Abraham God asked him to go and bring his son Isaac to the altar there uh, and um, it was a test to see if he would trust God with all things including his own and uh, there's a message there for us this day that we can all receive we also have the ladies uh, a trio uh, singing for us this is my father's world and uh, so that would be uh, good as well. I have been gone all week uh, on vacation uh, in Colorado where I grew up and, and experiencing some of the mountains and, and that as well and some rest. So I've been thankful for that. And, uh, but I'm back now and to be in the office there on Tuesday if you need me. Uh, just a couple quick announcements uh, before we begin in our service. Uh, the first one is that July 4th, just a reminder, that service, that Sunday, is going to be at 10 a.m. And it's going to be in Waverly on 141st Street, right outside the Waverly Foundation building there, um, community center type building. And uh, we're going to have an outside worship service, and then we're going to have a, a barbecue lunch together, being July 4th. And then the parade in Waverly starts at 1 p.m. So if you want to hang out with us for a while until the parade starts, or if you want to take your lunch and go, that's fine too. But we hope you'll join us 10 a.m. Uh, right there in Waverly for our church service that day. We also have a baptism service coming up on uh, July 18th. And again, very thankful for the seven people who will be baptized that evening uh, at Heather and Rick Perkins' house right on 84th Street near the church. We'll have more information for you on that. Um, but hope that you can come out and celebrate with those who are professing their faith in Christ and to have also a, a dinner together there 
Um, it'll be a potluck style in a way. You bring a side dish to share and then bring meat for your family to put on the grill. And um, it'll be a good, good evening together. That is July 18th at 5 o'clock at Rick and Heather Perkins Place. I hope you have a wonderful uh, Father's Day here and uh, the message by Jorge uh, from Genesis 22, one of trusting in the Lord and giving him all that we have, including our families, trusting him with those that we hold dearest to us. In Jesus' name, we, uh, we give it up to him. Amen. I'm reading here about Abraham, beginning in uh, Genesis chapter 22, uh, verses 1 through 8. A note here that uh, Abraham, remember, is a hundred years old at this point. Reading from the New King James Version. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham? And he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father? And he said, Look, here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went together. 
And they reached the place that God had told him about. Abraham built an altar and placed wood on it. Next, he tied up his son and put him on the wood. He took his knife and got ready to kill his son. But the Lord's angel shouted from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Don't hurt the boy or harm him in any way, the angel said. Now I know you, are tr you truly obey God because you are willing to offer him your only son. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the bushes. So he took the ram and sacrificed it on, in place of his son. Abraham named the place the Lord will provide. Now even the people say on this mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Welcome, welcome, Bethlehem. Um, for those that do not know me, my name is Jorge Zuniga. I'm part of the Deacon Board. I work as a professor at the University of Nebraska Omaha. Pastor Dan asked me to help him, so here I am. Um, I want to start with talking a little bit about the passage we just read, the sacrifice of Isaac. And let me tell you, it's not an easy one to read. It certainly makes me anxious, makes me sweat. Uh, it's a hard one. Um, what is remarkable, it is the, not just the amazing faith and obedience shown by Abraham, but what I think is absolutely outstanding is Abraham's willingness to face his human nature face to face and let go of his son Isaac. In a way, our children are a reflection of ourselves and we are biologically inclined to protect them no matter what. That's how God made us. There are, of course, psychological evidence suggesting that those that are unwilling to die for a cause typically confront this type of situations with honor and bravery. And that's what Abraham did. He let go from the moment God talked to him. He let go of his own son, Isaac, from that moment. And he did face this hard situation with honor, bravery, and faith. As a father, Abraham did the ultimate sacrifice. He let go of the most precious thing he had on this world. No wonder the Bible has kept us, kept us together for such a long time, you know, civilization after civilization. I'm always amazed of what's happening even right now. You are listening to this video, to the sermon, in peace, I hope, but certainly you are not going to your neighbor houses and make war and conflict. Most of us behave properly, and, and that's am it's amazing. On this world and how complex human beings are and full of sin, even then we behave properly, and there you are listening to this, trying to behave as proper as you can. It just blows my mind that we can do that. Of course, it doesn't surprise me because, as you know, the Bible has given us rules and morality for us to follow, examples of all kinds for us to proper behave. The fact that you are still sitting here and listening in a respectful manner is not by mistake. The stories of the Bible, like the one from Abraham, has kept our society together, functioning properly, and provide the ultimate example for us to follow. And Abraham wasn't perfect. He made many mistakes, but his willingness to face his inner monster was truly, truly remarkable. The Greek word 
for sin is hamartia. And hamartia means missing the mark, missing the point. In a way, sin is missing the bullseye. Sin can be understood as not placing the arrow in the center of the target. So you can certainly aim at it, and you can try as hard as you can. But if you don't have enough practice, you may still miss 10 out of 10. You know, what I'm trying to say here is that avoiding sin needs a lot of practice before you even get good at it. The way I rationalize, you know, the fact that Abraham was 100 years old when he had his son Isaac is a very practical one. I'm a very, very practical person. And the way how I think about that is because I believe that Abraham needed the required time to try and practice. Practice in aiming for the bullseye, getting it right. Even then, he still made many mistakes. Perhaps the Bible is telling us that recovering from our mistakes and keeping aiming at the bullseye is far more important than hitting the actual target. And even then, when you, when you finally get good at it, you still have to let go. Now, got to be honest with you, the, the big problem with this biblical proposition is not minor. Because, you see, recovering from our mistakes implies performing sacrifices to achieve a goal, but then failing at it. Not one time, but many times, over and over. And the scientific evidence is extensive on this matter. The majority of people, when they perform sacrifices and then fail to achieve their goal, they become emotionally hurt. They hurt. And when they become hurt, they become resentful. And when they are resentful, they become vengeful. And let me tell you, there's many steps after vengeful. It's just a matter of watching the news and see people doing horrible things to their peers, shooting at them for absolutely no reason other than vengeance. So what do we do? I'm not sure. But perhaps this old understanding, old, old, old and ancient says from the Bible that talking about life being mostly suffering and sacrifice, like the life of Jesus, like the life of Jesus lived, the life that's described in the Bible, may be worth remembering once in a while. You can certainly say that life is happiness and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when I look at the Bible and I look at the life of Jesus, I see moments of happiness, I see moments of joy, but I see a lot of suffering and a lot of sacrifice. I see meaning in the things he did for us. And I can't help it to try to parallel my life with a biblical life. And if that's the case, my argument that life is sacrifice, and suffering, may be a one to consider. All right. So it is Father's Day after all. So congratulations to all fathers for being a father and showing up. Uh, so a lot of the things I'm going to talk a little bit right now because it's Father's Day is kind of geared towards us fathers, but also applies to mothers, and not just applies to sons, but also daughters. I have two sons, so I can help myself to say sons and keep referencing that, but you understand what I'm meaning, right? 
talking about fathers and their sons, it means the same for fathers and daughters. So, because it's Father's Day, you know, it seems very appropriate to explore our immediate steps to help us navigate this adventure of being a father. Abraham was always willing to face his inner monster. So it seems logical for us to look at ourselves in the mirror and try, try to understand what type of monster we are. And Please, I, what I mean with this is a, is a reflection from human sin and our, the need of God in our lives. That's what I mean with facing our monsters, facing our sin. That's always there. We think it's gone, but really it isn't. It's waiting patiently for weakness and lack of faith. So, because of this urgency of facing this monster, I figured I, I all start, you know. I'm a father and I had to go first. I have to face my monster and I want to do it here in public. It's not easy, but it's, it's needed. It's needed to serve God and it's needed to be a better father. So I'm going to expose my monster here in public with the goal of improving my aim and someday get closer to the bullseye. What I'm about to tell you is, of course, embarrassing and, 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 and make, it will make you uncomfortable. Um, so please forgive my my honesty. So there is this image of myself that I want to project, but it seems fake at times. And I know it's fake because my wife and I have discussed this at length. You know, if the person that lives with you and put up with all your miserable selves, my, myself, my miserable self, in a daily basis has something to tell you to maybe improve your life, well, you better listen. So I did. I listened to the things this person is telling me, this person that shares with me the good and bad moments that her only intent is to make me better. Is the stakes are high. We have a family and we have a marriage. So I'm listening. You know, I often want people to think of me as a smart person, you know. I'm a professor, so I can't help it. I uh, also want people to think of me that I'm a fearless disciple of Jesus, that I'm a good guy, that I'm a good husband, that I'm a good father. <laughs> it may seem silly, but I also want people to know that I know soccer a lot and that I'm good at it. It, it may not mean much to, much to you, but it means a lot to me. And it's part of this fakeness nature. It's part of this monster I face every day. But you know what? The truth is a lot different. And I want to come forward with this and tell you, um, well, I'm not smart as you think. I'm very afraid of way too many things. And, and I'm also very insecure, you see. I had a speech impediment when I was little and fear of public speaking, which I had to get rid of because it's required of me. Um, I'm not always a good person. And you know, I have narcissistic tendencies. And yeah, I do have a bunch of soccer certifications, but Sometimes I feel that has nothing to do with coaching your kid better. I coach a lot of you kids, high school and middle school, and it has to do with control and micromanaging. And I have put people down on that environment, on, on soccer things, Co other coaches and people that just try to help, I put them down and it, it doesn't feel good. Because that's not what the Bible is telling us, that it's not true. It's not the truth. It's not what we should be pursuing. 
But you know what? It gets a lot worse. I, if you think that's it, it, it isn't. I wish. A um, few years back, I mean, not that many, I used to humiliate, humiliate people like you. People like you that are watching this and that believe in God. I, I didn't used to believe in God. I thought it was silly. I thought that Darwinian, the Darwinian theory of evolution had all the answers, but that was a lack of scientific knowledge and a lack of faith. And I did, I said horrible things to people like you. And again, it doesn't feel good. Uh, I truly believe that to serve God and become a better father, we have to face this monster. I am choosing to tell you this right now for that reason. I think that I needed to look at myself in the mirror and see what type of monster I am. And I found out that the beast is, is ugly. Maybe some of you right now, fathers, you know, at this minute, I are thinking on those things that you may want to change. Maybe your relationship with your son or your daughter is not as good as you thought it would be. And to be completely honest, you know, we raise them. We raise our children. We influence them. There is absolutely no reason for that not to be the most meaningful relationship we can have with somebody in our lives. If it isn't, it's not because of them, it's because of us. We are doing something. And if you maybe are thinking about things like this, or maybe improving your marriage, like I am doing right now, facing your most monster face to face, this, this is the time. This is the time that we can come clean and start again. Uh, listen, you're not alone. You're not alone. We're together on this. Of course, I can find a lot of excuses to justify my behavior, and the one I use the most is victimizing myself about the horrible things that happened during my childhood. You, you know, my, my father was a violent, a vicious alcoholic. In the mix of, of our poverty and food insecurity, he would hurt my mom and chase my brothers and I with a gun for absolutely no reason. He was the scariest individual when intoxicated. The one thing that was very intriguing to me growing up on this environment was that when he was sober, sober, you know, not under the influence of alcohol, he was the most docile and loving man you could ever see. He often, you know, forgot about all the bad things he did the night before giving the illusion that maybe not, nothing ever happened. It was like looking at yourself in the mirror and not seeing, not seeing the monster you are. He died of alcoholism last December after a very long and pay, painful death. You know, I've been reflecting about my work performance as, as a father since then wondering what type of monster I see when I look at the mirror. Because, again, I believe that you need to know what type of monster you are to become a good father and, and to serve God. And as I told you earlier, this is a reflection of our sinful nature and the need of God in our lives. You know, this victimizing story I tell people to justify my behavior is usually unfair because it was true there were people that care about me and gave me the necessary love to me for me to aim and trying to aim at the target in a reasonable way. We love our children with all our, 
hearts, with all, everything we have. All fathers here, all fathers here watching this, this recording would sacrifice their life for their children without thinking about it. So this extreme and ra radical love we feel for our children is not a joke. And you may say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Well, you, you really don't because it's, it's hard to explain. Science haven't figured it out yet all the things that a father or a mother can do for their kids. There are reports of, of people lifting heavy objects that they would have never lifted before just to save their kids. It is almost unpredictable what you can do because you love them so much. It's unpredictable. There is no words to describe it. There isn't. As a parent, you have the moral obligation to encourage your child to go into the world and to be whoever they can be, to be the best they can possibly be. By doing so, you're encouraging them to pursue what's good, in a way sacrificing them to the good. You're not keeping them for yourself selfishly, even though you may want to. You are telling them that they can go out and live their lives and live them properly. You don't want for your child what you want for yourself. You want for your child what would be best for God, for the world and himself. And then you let go. That's the hardest part. As far as I'm concerned, you know, this is the perfect analogy to the idea of the sacrifice of Isaac. You know, one of the pure things that I enjoy and I, it's going well for me is, is the work I do. I, I work with children that are missing limbs and I build artificial limbs for them to help them and, and their families. So one of the things we teach these children is that they need to do things by themselves. And we are serious about that, very serious about that. So when they're learning to use their prosthesis, this artificial limb, we give them some assistance and we give them training and we help them. But then we pull back and let them struggle. There is a small amount of suffering on that. You can see it and you can feel it, even in a five-year-old. You, you can see this on their eyes. They're anxious. But, but here's the thing, we do not interfere with their struggle. We do not interfere with their learning. Because in the future, we want them to do things on their own. That's just better for them, for their society and their parents. We have a rule of thumb in prosthetic therapy which indicates the following. Do not do anything for those able to do things themselves. Because if you do so, you will compromise their independence. As a father, you pull back and pull back, and you let your child hit himself with the world. And it feels like you're failing to protect them. But by failing to protect them, you're encouraging and enabling them to aim and practice to aim for the bullseye. And doing so without your help, so they can be helpful to themselves and others. A good father is the one willing to sacrifice their child for the ultimate good. You do, the, you do this because you want them to move forward and be like a light on top of the hill in the middle of the darkness. The hardest thing for us in the laboratory when we're working with the parents and the children is to make sure mom and dad sit down and let them struggle. Parents get really anxious about this, and you can tell an easy feeling. 
little bit of suffering on that as well. But you know what? Eventually they, they let it go for the sake of the child improvement. They let it go for the sake of their sh child's improvement. Meanwhile, the kiddos struggle in doing things and look at the parents asking for help. And <sighs> but most parents, you know, the good ones are able to let it go even though they feel the extreme sense of urgency of helping them. That's the kind of love that parents have for their children. They let go. But you know, everything changes when out of nowhere the child is able to, to make it all work. Not perfectly, I mean, very small improvements very small progressive improvements that that's is, that is the moment when the child transcends and becomes somebody else. It becomes like a, like a superhero. You can see it on his eyes. Folks, um, I am who I am because of that alcoholic man that raised me and fed me. I am who I am because of that imperfect man that failed to protect me when I needed him the most. I am who I am because when he missed the bullseye over and over, he was able to let go. I have no doubt that the Lord forgave me. I have no doubt that the Lord forgave my dad. And I know that he's in heaven right now listening and enjoying the peace of being able to look at himself in the mirror and see God. Folks, fathers are not perfect. But the impact we have in our children's lives is long lasting and eternal. Thank you for listening. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for all you do for us, Lord. Lord, as fathers, we're not asking you to make situations less scary. Facing our monsters is a scary and not an easy thing, Lord. We're not asking you to make the environment less scary. We are just simply asking you, Lord, to make ourselves braver and face what we need to face, Lord. There's no time. The clock is ticking. We have to do this, Lord. Help us. In the name of Jesus, amen.